without taking much of the time i think the time is on and we should start today's uh, yoga session i will invoke uh, with the gayatri mantra followed by uh, guru gayatri mantra so all are requested to join our palms together gayatri mantra all together om bhur bhuva swa tatsavetarvarenam bhargo devasya dhimahi dhiyo yonaha prachodaya om tat param paryaya vidmahe ज्ञानलिंगेशरा धीम तो गुर प्रचोदया ओ योग महर्षि डॉक्टर स्वामी गीतानंद गिरी गुरु महाराज की जय अगेन हार्टी वेलकम टू वन एंड ऑल एंड टुडे वी आर ऑन द फोर्थ डे ऑफ द सेवन डे अवेरनेस प्रोग्राम organized by live holistic wellness under the very sincere and divine guidance of geeta ananda yoga tradition and today we have with us yogacharini kalavati devi ji uh, if we just give a brief introduction about her she is a senior teacher from geeta ananda yoga parampara and uh, she is in 2010 she was awarded with the prestigious title yoga chamber for her service to yoga and also in 2019 she was awarded the title karma yoga shiromani and she teaches a variety of classes which includes general yoga pregnancy yoga and yoga for kids and corporate yoga therapy that we will sing today and uh, ma'am also teaches a yearly yoga foundation course and she teaches a yoga teacher training both run in association with uh, yoga acharya dr anand bal yogi bhavanani sir and kalavati ma'am has taught a lot in the community where she works with people with breathing and health related problems and many of them are in charity based for free of cost and she don't take any money for that and she is also the director of both yoga wales and the geeta ananda yoga society for the uk and is the main contact in the uk for dr ananda and geeta ananda yoga so mam also has her own studio uh, the studio name is om studio and she will be telling more about that uh, and uh mam is a very humble person also and every geeta ananda mentor is really very enthusiastic to share and care and uh, thank you so much mam for uh, for uh, just uh, giving uh, your valuable time and over to you mam uh, and today's topic uh, is asana and we will sing that asana uh, is very broad concept and we are more focused on the asana aspect and istiram sukham asanam as maharshi patanjali ji says and uh, but we are mostly limited with the posters and the instagram photos and all that but bef- but beyond that what actually asana is we will be learning more of that secret what are the secret so over to you ma'am thank you thank you for the very lovely introduction and i'm very happy to be here i really appreciate um the invitation to come and speak with you all um uh, an interesting topic that was um given to me um so it's caused me to think somewhat in um how i present it and obviously the topic is about asana but coming from our tradition as much as asana is very um prevalent in our tradition and it has its uses um there's many other aspects sort of around asana that i find are as important or perhaps even more important um we often um in the west see asana as um kind of the the end product of yoga whereas in our tradition it's um just a means towards the end um you know we would see asana as very much as to enable you to keep your body nice and strong and healthy so that you can live a good life you can live a nice long life and not be restricted in a physical way um due to just general life you know how we how we stand how we 
to, you know, sit, how we move. Um, so asana is, you know, very, very important. Um, but there is a much, much bigger picture which I'm going to share with you all today. So I'm just going to do a screen share because I've created a presentation. Okay. So the topic that was given to me was asana awareness and alignment. I just need to move this. There we go with that. Okay. So let's start with asana. When most people come to yoga, they come to it through the physical practices. They might um, be looking at a yoga class. Um, they might be looking at pictures that they've seen on the internet, somebody that they know does yoga, and it's very much associated with a physical practice. So asana as we know it is a bodily discipline and in recent years has been hugely popularized and is one of the biggest businesses in the world. And we can see this just by the amount of, I call it stuff, that's sold um, related to yoga. You can, it, you know, it really is ridiculous. If you go onto uh, the internet, Google or Amazon or whatever, and look at all the different um, things that you can buy um, for yoga, there's just so much out there. There's a prop for everything. Um, special yoga clothes, um, you name it, it's out there, it's been marketed and it is such a huge, huge financial business in the world. However, according to Yoga Maharishi Dr. Swami Gita Giri, it is only when your mind, emotions and body work harmoniously together with that real self within, then yoga can be said to exist. And he goes on to say how yoga should not be approached purely in a materialistic manner. Yoga is also a spiritual path whose aim is the individual realization in consciousness of the independent, self-existing, self-originating, indwelling spirit of man. So clearly, a large amount of yoga that is around at the moment is very much in the material sense, which is very, very different to how um, I have trained in our tradition and how yoga originally um, came around. So from this, we can understand that yoga is not about standing on your head or putting your feet behind your head or bending your body into the most unusual shape that you can imagine whilst placing yourself on a beach with a sunset behind you. So I think Instagram yoga is probably one of the biggest avenues of yoga at the moment. I'm sure I don't really use Instagram. I um, I have an Insta Instagram account and I'm a bit rubbish at it. I don't post very often, but I'm sure if you go in there and search, you'll just see hundreds of thousands of images of people in these beautiful settings doing all sorts of different positions, most of which probably aren't even um, a traditional yoga posture and have purely been made up because it looks good in the picture. So yoga is much more than this, and we can confidently say that yoga is a way of life. And to study this way of life, we need to look at the whole picture of which asana is just a part. Swamiji taught us to follow the path of Rishi culture Ashtanga Yoga. The eight-limbed path of yoga as codified a few thousand years ago by the sage Patanjali. Prior to that, it was taught verbally and passed down between guru and chela, or teacher and student. And this too um, has a history of thousands of years. So the, the whole, um, if you trace yoga back through Hinduism, through Sanata Dharma, there's many thousands of years uh, of this tradition. And one of the beautiful things of Gita Nanda Yoga is that this tradition can actually be traced um, all the way back to the Sapta Rishis, which is, you know, at the very um, early days. So looking then at Ashtanga Yoga, so yoga is highly ethical and the first limb of the five virtues or morals called the Yamas. You have Ahimsa, which is non-violence, Satya, which is adherence to the truth, Asteya, non-stealing, Brahmacharya, which is control of sensuality, and Aparigraha, non-greed. 
So they sound very simple when you read them like this, but I can remember when I trained in the ashram, I did a six months intensive course, their teacher training course, and this was done with Amaji Minakshi Devi, which is Dr. Ananda's mother and Swami Geetananda's wife. We would spend hours and hours and hours over numerous um, satsangas, which was our evening lectures, purely just on one yama as we would go into it in depth and look at it from all angles. Um, for example, e you know, each one can be taken like this in its own right, but um, if I look at Asteya, which is non-stealing, um, you can say, okay, well, I don't steal anything. I don't steal from shops. I don't steal from people that I know. Um, but then, for example, when I was in the ashram, we were told to lock our doors. Okay, always keep your doors locked because if we kept our doors unlocked, we were presenting an opportunity for, to, for somebody else to maybe take something from our room. Um, and that in itself is not adhering to our stayer because even though you not might be sealing anything, you're presenting an opportunity for somebody else to maybe come in and steal. And then obviously you had physical aspects of stealing, you had... Uh, one of the major things that we often don't think about is um, stealing time. Um, you know, are you visiting somebody and maybe overstaying your welcome? That's stealing time. Are you letting somebody do that to you? You're letting somebody steal your time. You have um, stealing somebody's name. If somebody um, has an idea and then you perhaps tell somebody else that person's idea and you don't say that this idea belonged to this other person then you're stealing their idea you know even though you might think well ideas can't be stolen but you're you're kind of taking the credit for it so this this all comes into Asteya and then you have the planet what are we doing to the planet you know are we stealing from the planet are we not recycling are we driving a very dirty old car which is damaging the planet all of these things need to be looked at so each of all of the um, these yamas can be looked at in this way and even though i've just elaborated just a very very little bit on asteya you can see how quickly they can open up and um, take a vast amount of thinking about to be able to um, really start to take these uh, virtues into our daily life so the second limb supports how yoga is highly intellectual. Since this requires us to use our reason, to be rational and to inquire. So five conditions must be observed at the level of the mind called niyamas. And these are called saucha, which is inner and outer cleanliness. Santosha, this is mental serenity. Tapas, which is discipline and Swadhyaya, which is self-knowledge through introspection. Swamiji says that Swadhyaya is awareness of the accuracy of reports of the senses, as well as the factual basis for one's mental conception. The fifth Niyama is Atma Pranidhana, and Swamiji states that this is instant obedience to the dictates of the higher mind through intuition of the self. This um, statement is an absolutely beautiful statement. And I've taught Swamiji's step-by-step -step course uh, for many, many years to, um, oh, I, I, I really don't know how many groups, um, 30, 40 plus groups of people. And I don't know how many times I've read this course book because I have to go through it each time I teach it. And I've been through the book numerous times and one day this sentence or this sort of quote just jumped out at me and it's almost though it had never been in the book before i'd never read it and it had a huge huge impact on me as to the meaning of atma pranidhana um just to be able to respond and act in a way where you're it really is you're doing the right thing at the right time not for any other reason other than it is the right thing to do um, and you're just intuitively um, acting and just being in the moment um, so you're 
you're receiving this intuition and um it's almost like you are the intuition you just become it and it was just such a beautiful um, moment when i read this and a, and a penny kind of dropped so this in itself cannot be achieved without awareness and awareness is very much required throughout all of the yamas and the niyamas so you can see as i mentioned before with asteya all of those different angles that you can look at um, that kind of angle can be taken for each yama and each niyama and an awful lot of awareness um, needs to be cultivated and used to be able to um, bring those uh, yamas and niyamas into your life so that you can actually um, become a more ethical and moral person which is how the um, yoga life starts to grow and flourish within you. So pranayama is the third limb. This initially entails learning to breathe, but ultimately is the control of the vital life force called prana through the air that we inhale. So how can we learn to breathe if we do not know how we breathe? And I think that's one of the first issues with, pran with you know, pranayama. Um, people just breathe. We just breathe. So you, you don't think about it. You don't think about it unless you have a problem with your breathing. If you maybe you've been running and you're out of breath or there's a situation where you can't breathe, um, maybe you have asthma, maybe you have anxiety or a panic attack, you know, these kinds of things will make you think about your breathing. But other than that, we don't think about how we breathe. So to think about how we breathe, you need to start to becoming aware of the breathing. And that way then you can learn how to breathe. Our tradition of yoga, yoga has an incredible um, system of um, learning how to breathe, which I've not come across anywhere else at all. Um, and it's a really, really useful practice to take on because you can really um, increase your lung capacity, learn about all the different areas of the lungs. Uh, I don't want to talk about pranayama too much because we're obviously um, on a different topic on this. Uh, on this presentation, but just to um, give you a little bit of information from my own experience, I, um, during my training, noticed, you know, we'd been learning to breathe for some time uh, at the beginning of the course, and I noticed that my lung capacity wasn't up to the same um, uh, potential as those people that I was learning with. And we took on this extra practice uh, which is a practice where we use hasta mudras, which are different hand positions that we can um, we can do. And these hand positions send a signal to the brain, which tells the respiratory system that we want to do certain things with our lungs. So there's this one particular practice called production of pranayama, which enables you to stop all the air going into one lung so that you can just focus on all the different areas in the other lung. And we did it into the one lung, which was fine. And then when we switched over, I had this um, incredible feeling of, oh my goodness, what's going on in my body? And where the Hasta Madra had stopped the air going into um, one lung and it sent it all over to the other, I was made very aware that that lung didn't work. Okay, so this through this practice, I discovered a lung that didn't work. Um, and according to my mother, they think I had pleurisy when I was little. Um, so it's quite possible for the best part of about 30 years, I hadn't been using that lung. So this practice sent the air into that side, which had just shut down at some point, but it was still there and it could still work. So then I had to, using my awareness and focus a lot on that lung, bring that lung up um, so that it could work alongside the other one, which take, took a long time. Um, took a long time and this is more than 20 years ago now and this you know the lung is pretty much um, doing the same thing as the other one now sometimes I notice a little bit but this just shows you the power um, of pranayama and uh, you know and this was just the stages of learning to breathe and but without these techniques in yoga I probably would have spent my whole life never knowing that one lung wasn't even working so it's a huge, um, for, to me it's incredible, absolutely incredible and it blew me away and I've actually come across other people 
uh, with the same issue. Um, or people, you know, when we do these practices, you can feel certain parts of the lungs are stronger than others. Uh, so I highly recommend everybody um, takes the time to learn um, to breathe. And it really is the best gift um, that you can teach anybody. And as I said, we can't learn to breathe without awareness and we cannot know how we breathe without bringing awareness to it. So pranayama is a huge learning curve in awareness because pranayama without awareness would be impossible. There are so many pranayama techniques that help grow your awareness ability. For example, vibhaga pranayama and the hasta mudra, these are those initial learning to breathe stages and then the production of pranayama which I mentioned you have things like Savitri pranayama, Surya Nadi and Chandra Nadi pranayama and so on. So asana is the fourth limb. The word asana actually means seat, a firm seat or to sit and this is very far from what is understood nowadays for the term asana. I can remember Dr. Ananda saying once, um, what is your asana? And from this, he wouldn't be wanting to know what your favorite yoga posture was. He would want to know what your position was on something, what, what your position in life was, where you stood, how firm do you stand? Are we solid and are we strong? Are we balanced and are we grounded? Okay, this is all asana within the context of yoga. So it's not just... Um, as we see now in modern times, that um, physical posture, which um, you hopefully look great in. So Swamiji states that yoga in its kriyas and prakriyas, methods and techniques, deals with the government of the mind and the control and regulations of the mind and the body by the Atman, the indwelling self. Its entire process is centered on awareness. So Pratyahara, the fifth limb of Ashtanga Yoga, uses awareness to understand the senses and the effect that they have on us. Only when we know this are we able to perfect them and then gain mastery of them. So what you can see is at the moment, um, I know we were the heading was Asana Awareness and Alignment, but awareness is... Um, it's in everything. Um, so we can't just, it, you know, it's not just something that's only in asana because we're in a, trying to practice a physical posture and have awareness in it. Asana is growing and cultivated through all of these other aspects of, um, you know, the traditional Rishi culture, Ashtanga yoga. So nowadays people think that they are meditating when they just simply sit still and close their eyes. Mostly what is happening here is the senses are still at play and the practitioner is completely unaware that this is not dhyana or meditation and that they are not even in the state of pratyahara. So in our tradition of yoga, um, we would um, uh, have a period of time when we uh, start a class where we sit quietly and we would call it quiet sitting rather than uh, meditation. Meditation um, to us is a very, very high advanced stage and it's something that you don't just sit down, close your eyes and do. Um, meditation is, takes an awful lot of um, effort and uh, time to be able to work towards and it's something that you, um, it's something that happens to you uh, rather than something that you can do. You cannot just sit down and do meditation. It's not a doing, it's more of a I was going to say it's more of a being, but I don't even know if that's right, really, because in meditation, you're not even there anymore. So you can't even be um, when you're in meditation. Dharana, the sixth limb, Dhyana, the seventh, and Samadhi, the eighth limb, they all use awareness to achieve such high stage, which states, which I will go into in a little more detail when we look at yoga as fourfold awareness. So fourfold awareness is something that Swami Gitananda um, introduces to us in his yoga step-by-step -step course, which is the uh, course that I've taught uh, many times. And he takes 
He takes a few lessons to talk about um, the fourfold awareness and awareness in yoga. So before we go on to um, Swamiji's fourfold uh, system of awareness, I would like to point out how Amaji Manakshi Devi Bhavanani, his wife and Dr. Swami Gita, uh, sorry, Dr. Ananda's mother, she rightly added to this by saying there are actually five stages to awareness and that you should actually start off by realizing how unaware you are. So when you realize how unaware you are, you then realize that there are four stages to um, awareness, which is what we call the fourfold awareness. So how aware are we of everything that we do? I think actually when you look at your average day in your life, you'll realize that you're mostly unaware of pretty everything that you do. You know, you get up, you might have a wash, um, go into the bathroom, you'll have your breakfast. How many of these uh, things that you do, are you actually aware that you're doing? Do you think, right, now I'm going to go and eat my breakfast. Now I am eating my breakfast. Now I am making a cup of tea. Now I am drinking a cup of tea. We don't. We just do these things. You just get up and just move around and, and you just do these things. So there's a lot of unawareness uh, in everything that we do um, during the day. And to bring awareness into our daily life is a, is a huge task. And I think the hardest part is to actually remember to be aware. One of the um, examples I do like to give when I talk about uh, being how unaware you are is how, how you can just be walking down a street and maybe you're going somewhere in particular, you, maybe you're on your way home from work or you're going to meet somebody um, but you're just on your way somewhere and before you know it, you found yourself walking into a shop that you were never meant to go into. And for some reason, um, there's a shop there, you know, it could be a clothing shop and you found yourself browsing or it could be a, a, a grocery kind of shop and you found yourself in there buying a bar of chocolate. Uh, and, it's, and it's often done through unawareness and just through... Um, just a, a reaction to something maybe just the shop was in the corner of your eye or you could see it coming or um, but it wasn't necessarily always a very conscious decision and I think an awful lot of our lives can be spent doing that so yoga is conscious evolution and it is through awareness that we can consciously evolve awareness might start as Swamiji says as a dull shadow but in time, through right effort, it will grow. So the first stage of the fourfold awareness is awareness of the body and how it works. So we need to look after it, we need to respect it, we need to love it, and we need to treat it in the right way. We need to become aware so that we do healthy things to our body and with our body. We need to have the right diet, the right habits, the right exercise. And we need to breathe correctly. And when, we, when you breathe in, you know, we need to know that we're breathing in. When we walk, we need to know we walk. When we're talking, we need to know what we say. How often do we open our mouths and stuff just comes out and we're not really thinking about what we're saying? So you need to know what you're doing in every moment. So this is the first stage of awareness so the second stage of awareness the this is the awareness of the effect that the emotions have on the body aware that right emotions will have a positive effect whereas negative emotions have a detrimental effect and this effect um, that, that comes on the body can often be seen in a physical way so jealousy Hate, greed, things like envy, malice, things like possessiveness are destructive, okay? So they will have a, a negative effect on the body. But also things like fear and embarrassment and diversion um, will also produce a negative effect. And the body can react in many different ways. Um, you know, you can get tension, you can maybe get tummy ache, you can get sort of diarrhea, um, you can get, maybe your skin might come out, um, in maybe rash or you know um, spots on your face or something there's lots and lots of different ways that these um, things can manifest 
um, in the body. And it's being aware that, you know, this can happen. I think that, um, you know, that sort of churning of the stomach is a very um, common one that people would be able to associate with. Joy, compassion, a desire to help, understanding, serenity, all of these um, will have a powerful and positive effect on the body. So ideally, um, you know, we want to be more um, involved in positive um, things that we're doing so that we do have sort of positive effects that come back to us rather than the negative ones. So we need to learn to be aware of our body before the emotion arises and before you become out of control or carried away. And this is where the breath is really, really useful. And you have that simple thing of just taking a deep breath and counting to 10. Um, yoga or no yoga, that is just simple advice that I think probably is common in most countries, if not all countries, where they say, take a deep breath, count to 10. And in that time, what happens is you normally just relax a little bit, that nice deep breath and then counting to 10 and slowly breathing out. And then uh, your sort of energy changes and then you can, um, because you've put, I suppose you've put a, sp a pause in, so you're not going to um, react so quickly. And because you put that pause in, you're then possibly, hopefully more likely to be able to respond differently in that situation and maybe not um, get carried away with the energy of those different emotions that were coming. So we need to learn and be aware so that we only give over to the positive energies, we resist the negative, um, but having the bigger picture and awareness so that you can see which they are and to respond accordingly. So you'll find that relaxation techniques and the sensory controlling Pratyahara techniques are helpful for developing this state of awareness. The third um, stage of awareness is of the mind and how it can control the emotions and the body. So being aware that the mind is just a part of the mind, here we can utilize the conscious part of the mind so that it can deal with the unconscious or the subconscious parts. When, sorry, well, when we become mindful and use the higher mind to work on the lower mind, this is actually called RDVRD. RD means higher and the VRD means lower. Dr. Ananda once likened this um, and used this example where he said, um, you could maybe have like a guard in a tower where he's looking out or a lifeguard on one of those platforms on a beach looking down um, to see what's going on. And if anything is wrong, then they can react and report on this. So this is how um, effectively you would want to be able to use the higher mind, to have that consciousness, to have that awareness, to be able to see what's going on in the unconsciousness or the subconsciousness and be able to work it out and um, put things right. So dharana and dhyana um, are used to help produce this awareness. So this obviously is a, a much higher stage in the fourfold awareness if um, dharana and dhyana are um, able to affect this. So the fourth stage of fourfold awareness is one of India's many paradoxes. Awareness of awareness is the last stage. This is where samadhi or cosmic consciousness opens up to us. Dr. Ananda described this um, as a beautiful stage where you could be performing, but you're not there anymore, or you're singing, but you're not there anymore. And it's, it's a situation where you become one with the state of being and I think this can happen in many many situations I um, spent many years um, uh, as an artist and I used to get absolutely absorbed sometimes uh, in you know my creations and so I can I understand when Dr Ananda says you know he was singing but he wasn't there anymore you know I had that same experience through um, the artistic creations that I used to do and I think most people um, can have sort of glimmers of this kind of experience. Maybe somebody was, you, you know, when you get so absorbed in something that um, everything else sort of ceases to exist. So if we move on to alignment, 
We would think that alignment, when we're talking about asana, means making perfect lines and shapes within the posture. And in many instances, this is what it means. However, the more I think of alignment, and I thought about this obviously quite a lot because when I was asked to give this presentation, I was, as I said, I was given this topic and it wasn't, um, I wasn't able just to come along and do it on whatever I wanted to. So I did have to go away and really think about this. And when I think of alignment, it made me think of loma veloma and polarity or balanced. Because it, I was thinking and it made me think that when we're aligned, you know, alignment isn't just a physical thing. Alignment is um, how you are as, as a person. And when you're aligned, I believe that it's the same as when you're grounded and when you're balanced and when you're po polarized and when you're in harmony with yourself that to me is alignment so when this happens physical alignment would naturally be in place since we are at one with ourself okay so that physical alignment um you know if you're if you're relaxed you're grounded you have this sense of um balance within yourself then i think physical alignment would automatically um come into alignment with you um, because, because you're harmonizing all aspects of your body. And so the alignment then just becomes a part of that. Um, so whether you are aligning yourself in your life or whether you're aligning yourself in a, a physical practice in a yoga class, providing you have that settled, grounded um, feeling, uh, and state of being within yourself, then you're going to be able to align yourself with things. Whereas if we are out of sorts, then we know that our balance and polarity, we won't be grounded. Um, and this then would affect our sense of self and our alignment. So awareness and alignment, these can be brought together in our yoga practice. So once we are aware of the breath and we have control of the breath, we can move our body with the breath. When we can do this simultaneously so that they both flow together, then alignment occurs since nothing will be out of place as we are in a state of being that harmonizes all experience into one. But I would like to point out that what is alignment for one person might not be for another. And this is because we're all different. We all have different bodies. Our bodies might have different length limbs. Um, we might have different amounts of tension in the body, different injuries, um, different strength. You know, we might be carrying different amounts of flesh on our body, varying flexibility. Um, and that will result in, you know, no personal alignment from being exactly the same. One thing that um, I have come across in more recent years as I've been training people, um, and that is that I've noticed that the positioning of the hips has a big um, difference on the groups of postures that you're able to do easily. And the hips, I did a bit of research on this, and it seems that the hips um, tend to fall into two positions, one which is rotated slightly more forward and one which is slightly more back. And I was noticing um, through having taught so many groups over the years that um, you can mostly split people into those who can squat with their feet flat onto the floor and those who can't. And that is a uh, being able to squat flat on the floor or not. Um, I believe is largely because of um, that positioning of the hips. And I noticed then that these two groups of people largely um, would be able to do certain postures easily if they were flat-footed squatters and then the others often couldn't do those ones and vice versa, the others would be able to do some more easily than the others. So it's really, really interesting. Like we really need to remember that you know, when we come to that physical yoga practice that every single body is different and we can only ever work with our own body. Um, and one of the beauties of teaching is
because obviously you're teaching from your own perspective and what you can do with your body if you can do something very easily you're never going to know what it's like not to be able to do something in somebody else's body so as a teacher you can absolutely learn so much from all of your students looking at how they move looking at um the ways that they put their bodies into these different shapes um, and so much can be learned from that and you know this learning can take years there was one um person i've had in um he comes for private classes and he struggles in quite a few things and he would come weekly and he's been coming for probably about three years now and we're you know, every now and again, we have these little enlightening moments of try this. Oh, wow. Then something, you know, helps. And, you know, he's able to move his body, you know, slightly differently. And it's this, it's almost like an unpeeling of an onion, you know, where, um, you, you know, you're, you're learning these little things as, as you look at this different body that, you know, that isn't yours. And it's, it's gone through life and um, it's experienced life and the body has kind of adapted to life and, um, you know, even just through working at a computer desk, all the shoulders can roll in and then that has an effect on everything else. Um, so you really, as a teacher, learn so much, you know, through the people that come to you. And um, it's, it's, it's really fantastic because it's, it may, means it's always different and it means you're always learning as well. So we can see what looks like a perfect posture with perfect alignment so this might be when you see somebody who's doing um, a very typical posture sort of perfectly like in a in a book or something like that but the reality of being able to achieve the same alignment and posture um, with another body isn't always possible because obviously as i've said we all have completely different bodies so we would all have our own alignment according to where our body is in that moment of time. And as the body changes over time, then also its alignment will change. One thing we must never do is force our own body or any else's, anybody else's body into a posture. The body will only ever do what it's able to do. And one of the things I tell my students is you can, obviously you, you want to, um, put some effort in so you need to push your body a little bit try and reach a little bit further but just a little bit each time so that the body changes gradually over time and um, because if you go forcing you're just going to end up um, either damaging yourself or not getting the uh, the real effect that you're you're looking for so when we um, correct somebody um, in a Gita Nanda yoga class, we would do this verbally. We don't, or hardly ever I say should, but I, I, I won't say we don't, um, but we very rarely will go around a class and um, manipulate people. Um, I've seen so many teachers when I've been to various um, different sort of functions where you've got lots of different teachers working and you're able to watch different things going on and there's been times when I've been absolutely horrified and you've seen people sort of yanking bodies pushing bodies trying to force their body into um, an alignment that is not natural for that person's body and um, some of it's actually really scary and it really looks like they could damage people so what we do in this tradition of yoga is we use our verbal instructions um, even if it's something as simple as, you know, have your arms at shoulder level. And if you can see somebody whose arms are either wonky or they're not high enough or they're too high, you know, you can, you can either just say, look at your arms, or you can perhaps say, you know, shoulder level isn't eye level, um, because often people will bring um, arms up or the hands up to the eye level instead of the shoulder level and give people that verbal cue. And that way they're able to go in and make their own changes um especially when when i have people coming to me for the first class um i often don't, won't say anything to them at all i'll just sort of let them be in the class um and i'll start to verbally um correct them you know if they come back and when they come back um and that creates an awareness for them as well because they're learning about their own body they're not just having somebody come around and move their arms 
um, you know, they're, they're thinking about what you've said. And sometimes you have to repeat things a few times. You know, if you've got everybody lying down on the floor and you said arms by the side of your body, bring the palms down to the floor, something so simple, palms down. And most palms go down and some are still up and you can say palms down again. And sometimes you can even have to say two, three, four times, um, you know, and it can take quite a while sometimes for people to compute what they're hearing, you know, that little something that has to go on in the brain, which then tells the body to actually do what they've heard you say. It's, it's very interesting to watch um, as a teacher. Um, so we would always, nearly always, a little bit occasionally, there's a um, couple of postures here or there that um, often do require um, a physical um, bit of help. Um, just because um, they're, they're often a little bit harder to do sometimes if, um, you know, to get that across. And people, people often try to look at what everybody else is doing as well. And if somebody else is reaching further than them, then they're trying to do the same thing. And that will often make them go out of alignment of to what is um, the correct alignment for their body. Um, so sometimes um, you might need to bring somebody up a little bit. Um, so that they're more in alignment. So constantly physically manipulating people doesn't enable them to grow their awareness as well as if they learn to adjust their own body themselves. So there's lots of um, practices, physical practices, which help create awareness. Most Kriyas in yoga um, will work here since Kriyas are a movement and when when we move especially in our tradition in yoga i know a lot of this modern yoga a lot of times um, they're not even told when to breathe and when to breathe out um, but the emphasis in um, in our tradition is to unite the breath with the body with the movement and because we've taught how to learn to breathe and we've learned how to slow the breath down and how to control the breath we're then able to move with the breath. So you join the breath and the movement together. So they flow, they become one. And you then, um, because you're, you know, you're able to do this, they're, they're very much, even if you're not able to do this in your learning and you maybe have this quicker breath and you've come to a class and the yoga teacher's maybe doing this six count breath and you're trying to slow your breath down, maybe the breath's a bit harder to slow down to begin with. Um, because that really takes quite a lot to learn how to do that. But you can maybe move the arm or whatever part of the body is uh, is slower. Those, you know, you've got the movement then with the arm, but the breath isn't there. But then over time, you're able to slow the breath down and eventually they come together. So most Kriyas in yoga will work in this way, you know, since you are combining um, the movement with the breath. Simple jerties, you know, you can just rotate the ankles um, you, and obviously you can do this in a very unmindful way. You can just spin them round and around and around in the same way a wrist. Um, you can just sort of do this without thinking about it and the other way, you know, without thinking about it. But if you really think about it and feel it, um, the breath often, uh, the movement would slow down and it can become very much um, a movement of awareness as you do this. So very simple jutties, rotating the ankles, the wrists, um, shoulders, you know, if you do it slowly and lift up and back, you feel all sorts of things in the shoulders. You can really feel where the tension is being held in the shoulders. And simple movements like that as well are going to also obviously help try to release um, tension. A shulka kriya is another lovely uh, movement that we can do with the breath. This needs to be done from a very straight sitting position. And if people struggle to sit, they can use their hands on the floor just to support the back a little because people aren't used to sitting on the floor very much these days. We're sitting in chairs most of the time. So to have that strength um, to be able to hold yourself upright, um, that can take quite a lot. But the Ashoka Kriya is a really lovely Kriya where the head is lowered down. And then you just breathe in as you take the head around, um, starting to the right side and to the back. And then you would breathe out as you bring the breath down the left side and back down to the front. So just very simple, simple movement 
but you're combining that breath with the movement and you get this lovely sense of flowing in the body. Then we have other practices, um, Eka Hastakona Kriya. Um, this is where we can do a simple arm lifting. You just breathe in as you're lifting the arm all the way up. And then you can breathe out as you bend over to the side. And you're doing all of this to a count. I would use a six count. So you'd breathe in and come back up. And then you'd breathe out and lower. We always use a six count um, in the things that we do. Um, I would, the six count, um, I can remember um, when uh, we were doing a lesson once in the ashram um, with Amaji and, and Dr. Anandam, we were talking about um, the counting. So I think I was actually giving a, a lesson and Amma said I was kind of t counting too quickly, but I was, I'd remembered somebody at some point saying um, that the count should be um, like six seconds. Um, and I think six, I think sticking to seconds, that sort of regular sort of count, six seconds is possibly even a little bit quick. Um, but that sort of six second count, especially when you're trying to keep together, when you've got a group of people, you really need to keep people together. And that count can sometimes be a bit slow for somebody, but it could also be too fast for somebody else. But everybody benefits because it might be too slow for somebody. Well, they need to learn and become aware of their breath so they can speed it up just a little bit and come to that six count. Whereas the person that can't um, quite meet the six count, they get something to aim for. So eventually over time, they learn to breathe slower and they learn to aim for that six count. Um, when I've got sort of groups of students who are on the training courses, uh, either the step-by-step -step course or the teacher training course, then I would perhaps bring in an eight count, that kind of thing. But I think ultimately, if you're working on your own, then that count, um, if I remember correctly, should be the same as your heartbeat. So if you're nice and relaxed and the heart is nice and relaxed with you, that would be your natural rhythm um, to work to. Um, Vairagya Pranayama is another nice Kriya to work with the breath and Vairagya Pranayama is um, when we're on all fours um, and we lower the spine and lift the head up on the in-breath and then we arch the spine and lower the head on the in-breath and this is a really really good one to bring breath and awareness together because that movement starts at the very, very both excuse me, the movement starts at the very base of the tailbone and it slowly works all the way up the spine. So when you um, just slightly lift the tailbone so that the spine can start to lower, you actually feel that movement go vertebra by vertebra all the way up the spine and it, and it ends in that head lifting up. And then when you again start at the tailbone on the um, out breath, you tilt that tailbone and you, as you arch up, you feel the movement again, moving up the spine vertebra by vertebra, and then the head lowers down. And this done with the breath as well. When you get that um, real awareness of breath and you've learned how to breathe and you can really feel it, this is actually working with the lungs um, to encourage deep breathing into the whole of the lungs. And when we take that um, maha yoga pranayama, that deep yoga breath, the lungs actually work. So the air comes into the low area first, then the mid and then the upper and then you breathe out and you empty from the low first and then the mid and then the upper. So when you have full awareness in this practice, you actually feel, you don't even have to breathe, that movement um, makes the air literally come in to the lungs in that order as you do that movement. So when you start off with the very tailbone, that low area is fi um, filling. Then as the spine is lowering, that mid-chest area. And then just as the head starts to come up, you feel the upper lung fill. Um, and when you, when you actually get that awareness and feel that, it's really, really amazing. And the same with the out-breath. When you start to move that tailbone, you feel the air squeezing out from the lower lungs. And then the same as the mid-chest as you arch up. And then as that head lowers, you feel the remainder of the air coming out of the upper lung. Chiri Kriya is very similar to the Viagra, uh, Viagra Pranayama um, because you're doing that same movement but you're adding a single leg lift at the, at, 
uh, as you do the movements. And what happens in that time is you're predominantly working one lung over the other. So if you have that awareness again, you can really feel um, the breath emphasized in the one lung as you're doing the leg lifting. Then we have Dunder Kriya. Dunder Kriya is a very nice movement. Um, a lot of the time when people don't have the awareness and don't have the body coordination, um, they'll do these things kind of either quickly or a little bit disjointedly. Um, if I just skip back, for example, to the Viagra Pranayama, um, what you happen with that one is often the head is one of the first things to come up and then they lower the spine. So it's just, oh, lower the spine, head up. It's not a nice flowy movement where they're, um, you know, where the movement's going up and down the spine. It can be very, very kind of disjointed. Um, and coming back to Dunda Kriya, what I find with Dunda Kriya is you say breathe out. This is where you're, you start on your knees and then you would breathe out and bring your head down to the floor in front of your knees. And what happens a lot of the time is people just, you say, breathe out and they go boom, straight down really quickly. Um, so often I'll bring that count in and, you know, to try and get people to move um, with the breath. Um, so Dundakri is very good also in this instance um, to create body and breath awareness. Padatana Kriya is a Kriya where we're moving with the breath um, from standing. We're doing um, forward bending and coming back up and backward bending. Um, so that's a very um, nice one to do as well. Really getting people to bring those two aspects together, the breath and the body. And then Ekapada Uttana Kriya, um, leg lifting. Uh, again, you can. I would always give that count um, so that people are um, lifting the leg all the way up on the six count. And when you get to the six count, they can flex the foot. And then you can point the foot and you can breathe out and lower the leg back down. So all of this done with a count um, is creating that body awareness, uh, you know, with the breath. And I can remember when I used to go to. I started my my yoga sort of um, physical yoga life um, by going um, to yoga classes a few years before I went and did my training in the ashram and I don't recall the teachers ever counting they just told you what to do and you just kind of did it so um, some people everybody you know they would just say do it three times and people would do it at whatever speed they did it um, and I always remember one other lady in one particular class I went to who always used to do everything really, really slowly. And I, I think I kind of followed her somewhat. I don't know whether um, it was a challenge to me to see if I could um, perhaps do it as she was. But I, I, re I remember or, or whether I naturally did things a bit slower with my breath anyway. I, I really can't remember. It was such a long, long time ago. But I do remember being in classes and... I would have done my three and everybody else had probably moved on to the other leg by then because everybody would be doing these things very quickly. So there's an awareness technique um, which if you can remember I would like you to um, go away if you can do a screenshot right now on your computer it might help you remember um, but if if you can have a go at this um, it's a really really interesting technique to do and I get all my students to do it and they're always surprised at um, how unaware they are throughout the day and this technique is from Swami Gita Nanda's um, step by step course and what he says is for a single day try and watch your every thought word and action and then for each of these, try and work out where they come from. So am I gesturing like my mother did? Am I repeating the same words as my friend? All, everything you do, see if you can work out where it's originating from, because it all comes from somewhere. Um, and quite often, we're kind of mimicking people. Um, and then we need to look at all these words, thoughts and deeds um, and see if they're good ones. Also check how you walk, how you sit, how you relax. Are they done in a yogic way? Do you sit straight? Um, you know, do you give your time, your body time to relax? Um, you know, are you a sloucher when you sit? All of these things. 
And then through being aware, you can make changes to um, all of these things and, and you know, cultivate that awareness. Trying to be aware throughout the day also of subtle actions and thoughts and words. And just to, just to spend that day, you know, really trying to notice everything, everything about your day, everything you're doing, thinking, saying, um, and as I said, you know, sort of work out where, you know, where they've come from. Um, and if you look at, if you have children or people around you, you can often see, you know, we pick things up off of people. So it's really interesting to do. Um, another one which, um, which I haven't written down for this presentation, it's literally just popped into my mind. And it's another one that I get people to do on my teacher training. I think it was one of the ones that Amaji got us to do on our teacher training. And that's just to sort of sit down for a period of time. It could be half an hour or an hour. Um, and just write down, you know, what comes into your head. And you'll be surprised at the stuff that goes through your head. You know, it's lots and lots of unaware, sort of mindless thoughts that just kind of go through your head. And if you, if you think, you know, on a daily basis, you know, how much of this stuff happens, um, yeah, it's quite a, a lot there. It's an interesting um, to do anyway, just to have a look at sort of how awareness that you, how much awareness you have of what you do. So if we have a look at um, alignment in asana, um, so the modern view of a perfect posture, ultimately there needs to be a cultivated amount of awareness and a strong flexible body. Um, because to do those perfect postures, um, you need to be able to know what you're doing with your body to be able to put it in a particular shape plus you know, would need that sort of strong flexible body. Um, one of the things um, that I would say though is just though just because you see something which looks really really perfect doesn't mean that everything is perfect and I had this amazing example once um, I was teaching a class and this girl came into this class. It was, um, there were 20 or so people in this class and lots of regulars, people that came regularly. And this girl, she was probably in her 20s. She'd never come to class before. And she was very slim. She was quite tall, super, super flexible. And everything we did, she did incredibly. And she moved in this really incredible way. And I could hear the internal thoughts of the class where they were looking at her and going, oh, wow, look at her. You know, everybody was kind of looking, not obviously looking at her, but they were, they were noticing her and looking out the corners of her eyes because she just moved amazingly and did all these incredible postures. And even I was kind of sitting there going, wow, look at her. And the funny thing was that class was in a town and I actually lived, um, it was in the city, it was in Cardiff City, and I actually lived in a town which was about 12 or so miles away um, from the city. And it was just a, within a week, I happened to go um, and meet a friend in a cafe. And we were sitting outside having a drink and two men and a woman came and sat on the table right next to us. And they were all sitting, they were all sitting there with their drinks, they were smoking cigarettes, and I was watching this woman, just looking at her, thinking, I know her from somewhere, but you know, I couldn't work out who it was. And I was watching her, and she was slouched in a chair, you know, really slouched back, really bad posture, smoking a cigarette. Um, and it came to me uh, that it was that girl that had come into the yoga class um, a week beforehand. And it, it was it was brilliant, you know, it was like, it really sort of brought home to me that you can see something perfect, but it actually really might not be perfect. And it's that whole um, lesson, isn't it, of not to compare yourself, um, not to compare yourself to something else because you might not have the whole picture. And that girl that looked so perfect in the yoga class, um, you didn't see the whole picture at all because I saw obviously that other side to her just within a week um, and saw that she might have great um, body control and 
um, how she was looking in the yoga class, but her posture and everything out of the yoga class was completely opposite end of the scale, completely the opposite. So one of the um, things to remember with alignment in asana is that you have to work with your own body and, and that is all that you have. Um, I've got no idea what the time is. Um, can somebody just unmute and let me know if I'm massively running over time or anything? Um, I'm just, uh, next is the Q&A session. So uh, if it can be concluded and we can take, uh, if you can take some questions and some other mentors have also joined and we can have a short uh, feedback from them as well. It will be- Absolutely. Perfect. Yeah, that's absolutely fine. Um, it's the problem with putting a, uh, screen shared um, yeah. presentation. I've got no, the clocks completely disappeared. Um, so a couple of examples um, where um, you can show alignment in the body um, would have been Trikonasana, um, which is a really nice posture that you can do. It's one, it's one of the few postures that I would do where I actually correct people. Um, and it's to keep that alignment. A lot of the mistake is people just collapse forwards as they're trying to get down further and further, but to keep that nice alignment to the side as you bring the hand down to the leg. And another example I would have given would have been Padangushasana, which is a forward bend where you catch the, um, uh, the big toes in front of you. Um, a perfect alignment of doing that would be when you do that forward bend, um, you would have the arms straight in line with the body. And if you're able to have that strength and that flexibility, you need a lot of flexibility in the hips, you would forward bend from the hips. So you've got a nice straight line through the body with your arms and your, with your arms in line with your body. Not everybody can do that. If you've got tension in the shoulders, you wouldn't be able to do that. So you'd find that the arms wouldn't be able to make a nice straight line and they would come forward somewhat. Um, so this is a sort of a perfect example where um, you can strive towards um, such a thing as perfect alignment, but the perfect alignment for a person who has shoulder tension would not be able to keep their arms straight in line with the body. So their perfect alignment at that time would be would not be a straight line, but as they loosened up their sh shoulders over time, hopefully that flexibility would happen and the body would change and they would be able to keep that straight line as they came forwards and down. So for me, um, this has been a really interesting topic um, because I think if I'd thought of alignment beforehand, I would have thought, um, you know, you would have these kind of perfect postures and, you know, perfect alignment within the postures. But really alignment in asana is something that we move towards each time we practice, okay? So with awareness, right motive and right effort, that is how we are going to achieve the best possible, you know, for ourselves. And that alignment changes, so it, it will be a, um, something that um, changes with you um, as you change in your journey in yoga. So I'm going to end my presentation there. I'm going to just stop this. Thank you, everybody. Oh gosh, I've gone massively over an hour. <laughs> uh, no issues, ma'am. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, and uh, Sir is also here. And if I can see any question is there, then uh, no questions till now, ma'am. So uh, thank you for explaining it very well, ma'am, the alignment and you have taken it from the fourfold awareness and the awareness of the unawareness, the core thing that you explained well. Uh, it is the basic thing that uh, one should be aware of all these things. Uh, so I just, uh, <laughs> I'm not the right person to explain it in a more detail. So I would like to invite here, we have uh, Dr. Meena ma'am, Dr. Ananda sir as well. So uh, both of them, if you can just uh, give some lights on, um, some share on your views as well. Uh, so I would like to invite Dr. Meena ma'am first, then Dr. Ananda sir. If it is possible ma'am. Yes ma'am. Yes, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's just right morning and uh, busy in the kitchen right now. <laughs> anyway, but I was listening. I had the video off and 
I was listening to what Kalavati has been, uh, you know, explaining such beautiful explanation uh, because all the techniques that were, uh, uh, you know, like uh, that we usually do in the Parampariya uh, have been like well put out and uh, clearly explained with her expertise and with her, her experiences over these years uh, with lots of anecdotes and with her usual humor. Uh, thank you so much, Kalavati. That was really wonderful. Uh, it's a beautiful continuation to what, uh, uh, to where Sangeeta left yesterday. So after uh, the Sparsha Mudras, uh, today I think Kalavati has taken over as a continuum and uh, uh, you get more practices about with Kalavati also. Uh, thank you so much, Kalavati. That was awesome. Thank you, ma'am. And uh, here I can see Bharat sir as well. If you can also share some of your views, that would be very helpful. Uh, Bharat sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, Neela Chal. Uh, thank you very much, Kal Kalavati. Um, I'm, uh, I'm currently involved in my first year of the, uh, the yoga step-by-step -step training, the 52-week training. And um, I find it such a powerful teaching, so comprehensive and, and so rich with, with materials. And so, for example, today was a wonderful uh, reminder to me of some of the core principles. Um, so um, very inspiring. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for sharing your views. Now I would like to invite Dr. Ananda, sir, to share your views and just to guide us uh, for continuation of this session, sir. Dr. Ananda. Namaste, sir. Namaskaram, Swagatam. And uh, there are a lot of Buenos Aires over there and maybe a few Bono Nortes also. Um, First of all, uh, Kalavati, thank you for that very uh, comprehensive uh, presentation. And I think one of the uh, big changes that has happened over the past year is many of our senior mentors who are used to teaching without PowerPoint slides, we have sort of made them start creating slides. And I know that Kalavati uh, creating slides is a new thing because she's so used to teaching just naturally. Uh, same thing with Sangeeta, though I'm sure at the university she would have used a few. So I think there's been a, this is a nice moment where we are getting our mentors into the academic setup. So they are preparing PowerPoint presentations and uh, slides and things like that. So uh, that is one thing. So it is nice to see it. I was enjoying her slides on uh, Hasta Mudras yesterday um, at the Center for Yogic Sciences and today on Asana. Um, I think there may have been a small slip of mind that happened in the beginning because I think, because what happened is I have been also doing like 33 things in the same time. I think there was a slide of pranayama before asana and I think you interchanged asana and pranayama as third and fourth limb. So I think I saw it. So we need to go back and have a look at it. And uh, there were a few more things which were happening. And uh, for those of you who don't know it, part of it, I would explain it as a very dear person. Uh, Jeremy's dad passed away this morning and I just saw it. So there's a lot of uh, stuff going on in our head. So I think that was the one thing which as I was logging in, I saw. So I would just like to, uh, you know, put out a small correction there in case somebody then later on says, does the Gita Nanda tradition have pranayama as third limb? No, asana is always third limb, pranayama is fourth. But I think what Kalavati was trying to say, and I think that's where that came in, was that we do not say that, oh, you have to first do all asana, then you do pranayama. The use of the breath starts right in the beginning of our tradition. In fact, in yoga step by step, Swamiji starts talking about pranayama way before he even comes into asana. And so the importance of pranayama percolates throughout the Ashtanga. And I believe that is what led to that uh, slide. So I just like to uh, make a clarification for those who are new to this teaching so that it's not, there's no confusion on it. The perspective on awareness is a very important aspect. And what Kalavati pointed out, 
alignment is never going to be perfect. And this is where our approach is very, very different. Very, very different because, and I see a question coming up exactly at this point. Uh, as I started saying it, I saw a question come up. Because what happens is many traditions are very focused on alignment of the external body. So either they want the person to be aligned or to use props to produce that alignment. So this is the normal approach in certain traditions which have become popular. Now, our tradition looks at alignment not just from the externalized point, but an internalized alignment, which is what Kalavati has stressed today, which comes when you go through the fourfold awareness. You start to align with basically your own energy flows. So the alignment is not the external body, the anatomical alignment alone, but you could say it is the alignment of the pancha kosha that is being stressed in our tradition, not just the physical level of alignment. Are you aligning with your breath? That is why you would have seen Kalavati stressing many times, doing the practice as you breathe in, two, three, four, five, six, breathe out, two, three, four, five, six. There's a lot of importance on moving with the breath. Because when you move with the breath, the Annamaya Kosha, anatomy, Pranamaya Kosha through the breath, and Manavmaya Kosha by the mindfulness, and the buddhi, because you are choosing to move with the breath. So the Vijnana Maya Kosha is also brought into place. And you then start to stretch yourself to other levels where the Ananda Maya Kosha comes in. So it is about aligning with the Pancha Kosha, which have gone out of alignment, which was the topic of Nara that was mentioned by Dr. Meena. So we are not worried about the physical alignment as much. It doesn't mean you can do sloppy asanas. It doesn't mean, it's not an excuse to do sloppy asanas, okay? You, you should try to be as aligned as possible, but more important is the inner alignment. And as Kalavati so rightly put it, it's a wise statement that alignment keeps on growing. It is like when we talk about perfection, you are never going to be completely perfect. You are a work of perfection in progress. You are a work of perfection in progress. Now, compared to when I was 10, when I was 15, I was a bit more aligned, a bit more perfect. When I'm 20, a bit more perfect. You know, what you're doing is constantly, you are trying to enhance that sort of perfection or let's replace it with the term wholesomeness, which is a better word. Perfection sort of is utopian. Wholesomeness, completeness, oneness. So this is how we are working. And the other thing which I've never heard Kalavati mispronounce Vyagra Pranayama. And definitely uh, there's a bit of Nara going on with you. And I attribute it to uh, Kalavati's closest student and who has come here so much. And in fact, it's in her studio where she's sitting right now. Jeremy's dad has taken some of the best photos of me ever. And I have posted on Facebook that he has taken the bestest photos of me in her studio right where she's sitting right now. And uh, so I, I'm, I'm just putting it in context. There's a bit of Nara there. I have never heard her mispronounce Vyagraha Pranayama. Vyagra means the tiger the tiger breathing, and I think she said Vairagya Pranayama. Now, I have never heard you say that. Yeah? So, I'm just putting it in context because all of us are human, and the greatness of this tradition is every one of us is understood as a human being who is constantly working on becoming a better version, and we make mistakes, and we are human enough. People say man enough. I say human enough to admit our mistakes. We are human enough to admit our mistakes and we grow in it. So I would just like to point a few of these things because beautiful roadmap map has been given by Kalavati. It's a beautiful roadmap to how you can align yourself through awareness. And where is that awareness? Inner awareness. It's not an external. You don't need a mirror to align yourself. You know, 
say I'm talking to Sandhya or Varata or Becky or uh, you know uh, Dia or Alex is there. In Alex, Alex is really having a bono notte. When I say bono notte, it's good night. You are in good night down there in Australia. So it really works. Oh, Maxine is there. You know, when we are When we are talking, say, I ask Maxine, who are you? That's my topic for tomorrow morning. Who am I? But if I ask Maxine, who are you? She doesn't need a mirror to tell her who she is. Alex doesn't need a mirror to tell him who he is. He knows who he is. The mirror is the externalized reflection, but you don't need the mirror to tell you who you are. The same thing with alignment. You don't need an external mirror to tell you whether you're aligned or not. You don't need an externalized CCTV to tell you whether you're aligned or not. It is an inner vision, antara drishti. And this is where there's a big difference between how many people approach because they are looking at only the perfection of the externalized posture. And that is why, that is why what Kalavati pointed out, your lifestyle and who you are as a human being is part of the bigger picture, not just whether you are well aligned in your asanas. Because a gymnast is extremely well aligned. You, you get those gymnasts into yoga asana. We now have yoga asana sport. You bring the gymnast in, they are going to be better than any yogi because they already have that externalized alignment. But do they have that sthirata and sukata? Is there a harmonious steadiness and balance and ease? That is the question. And that cannot be judged from outside. We always say, how do you judge sthirata? We say, okay, they're not, you know, they're, they're not shaking. So we say, oh, sthirata. And they are smiling. So the kids come into the asana, they go, and then, huh? So that, you know, they're showing sukha. I'm like, how false is that smile? See, it should be part of you. You should be a person who has that dynamic stability. Dynamic stability and that sense of ease percolating you. That is what Kalavati has given today. I think one of the most comprehensive explorations from within, that concept of alignment from within, she has given us today. Very, very beautiful because when I saw that topic, I thought, okay, Kalavati is going to focus on how the triangle should be there and the square should be there and the circle should be there. That is how we normally think. And she went into the depth. Really, Kalavati, that was a beautiful perspective. And uh, really, really uh, listening to you yesterday, listening to you today, uh, more and more, more and more I am... Uh, really, really starting to enjoy the fact I don't have to carry too much of the load. Uh, it can be shared with many of the mentors uh, because if you had asked me, say, two years ago to do something like this, I would have had to teach all the eight days. And now I just can come for the first day, last day, and come in and be this expert who just says a few words and makes everybody feel that I'm very wise, whereas I'm not. Uh, and what you said about mimicry, I love that. Are we just mimicking our parents? Are we just mimicking our society? Are they really our thoughts? Are they really our emotions? Or is it something that we are just copycat? And if you look at most people, you can deconstruct. I saw that word come up. You can deconstruct them and you would actually end up with originality zero. Plagiarism, 100%. If you do one of those plagiarism software and most human beings today, Originality zero, 100% plagiarism, 60% you know, parents, 30% friends, especially if they are in the teens. In the teens, it's like 60%, no, it's 90% friends and 10% of others. You know, it, it depends on your point of life. And I told Amma today, I, when I came back from lunch, I said, I gave this talk today. And I said, you know what? I am just the parrot. I am just the parrot who's repeating whatever you and Swamiji have put into me. What you both have put into me, 
is there and I just have to go and look inside and, hey, this is here today. Let me say this to everyone today. Hey, this is here today. This is a thought. Here it is. And sometimes I wonder about that. So what Kalavati pointed out is a very, very key essence. Please watch this a few times. Take notes. And really, Kalavati, uh, I keep on telling for those of you who are new to this, I, I always call her superwoman. And I saw Balaji also use that term. Because uh, seriously, if, if there is one person with whom I know I can be safe and I would never be in trouble, Kalavati tops the list. And there are so many stories uh, with her. And she has that capacity to be in the moment and do the right thing. And the integrity, the commitment to the tradition is unparalleled. She has been one of the first and foremost who has really, really taken the tradition forward, sharing it without any dilution and in such a beautiful way. So uh, I just wanted to express that today. Uh, thank you, Nilachal, for putting this together so that we can have these moments and uh, it's so important because yoga is not just about theory. Yoga is not just about technique. Yoga is all about being human and understanding life. And when we as a human being start to understand life better, well, we are on the path. We are on the path. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your words of wisdom always. And thank you for uh, Kalati, Kalavati ma'am for just explaining all the deep knowledges that you share today. And for the upcoming sessions and thing that we are planning for the next coming up days, I would like to just share a few things that first of all, uh, tomorrow that uh, there has the scintillating Saturdays and that is the 50th, that is the Golden Jubilee episode. So all are requested, all are uh, invited actually to attend that session that will be going to be very uh, very exciting uh, and please go and watch there and second thing that in the next uh, uh, that is tomorrow and tomorrow we will have another session with uh, our next mentor of Gita Nanda yoga tradition uh, and we will be discussing with uh, the relaxation techniques the secrets of relaxation and we will have our uh, speaker our mentor Ayogachari Gyanadev and Ayogacharini Deepika uh, so they will be explaining the core secrets of the relaxation. So stay tuned with us. And tomorrow, the timing will be 4.30 p.m. IST. So kindly uh, be on time. And, uh, and for the next sessions, we will keep reminding because we are just thinking of keeping our Sunday off. Uh, a lot of sessions are going over all there. So we'll, after the fifth day, I'm reminding you now only and tomorrow also we will just inform you about the upcoming sessions upcoming next day. So tomorrow will be one session then after that Monday we will have the next day sixth day and we will have Dr. Balaji sir who will be describing the core concepts of yoga therapy, the preventive supportive and curative approach and on the last day we will have a grand uh, explanation of this Gita Nanda yoga tradition from our beloved Yogacharya Dr. Ananda Balyogi sir and we will finish off from that and that will be the beginning I think and uh, and all these things have come up with uh, the live holistic wellness so keep uh, up, keep yourself updated with the the Facebook links and all the uh, links you are getting of uh, live holistic wellness and uh, and <laughs> Uh, nothing more to share more uh, just to keep updated and we are coming with up coming up with a lot of things that uh, will help you to be aware of uh, the things the Gita and the yoga tradition and i would like to just uh, share uh, uh nilachal yes sir yes sir i would just like uh there is in us here today yes sir so i would just like uh, you uh, uh, her to say a few words because uh, uh you don't get her on screen too much, so use the Definitely, opportunity. Definitely, sir. I was just, I just wanted to ask her, but I was getting afraid that should I say or not. No, no, you can, you can, you can. She yes, will sir. be happy. So, uh, ma'am, Devsara, ma'am, if uh, please, uh, you can Un unmute share. Ma'am, ma ma please share your, uh, uh, your words for us. Yes, ma'am. Namaste, everyone. Nice to see you all in the screen. Um, it's like a great pleasure always, just like having you in front of me like that. So even though we are in the long, long, long distance, 
and uh, it's a nice opportunity to come all of together uh, nilachal has a good idea to arrange this uh, thing so i want to thank him for this great opportunity and uh, the mentors also in the different way everybody they are reaching how much they can go so they are uh, doing so this also another thing to bring them all together and uh, so so many opportunities so many things going on still to keep in the framework so it's a great gift for everyone actually and of course uh, kalavati is uh, as dr says it she's super woman because i know her uh, very well she's coming every year to india almost every year almost every year she brought the kids also keshan from 6 month hams also quite soon uh, before their one year old even they are coming to ashram she's bringing of course uh, baby bring i don't know she, how she managed uh, i cannot do really we are not moving with divya and anandraj very soon out and all and uh, so she was bringing them and uh, uh, even to like a uh, they stopping putting like a gate even she was bringing still we have in the ashram for the dogs actually sorry i'm <laughs> using that so she used to uh, just manage everything i don't know how she managed actually she used to come and she's just teaching there also she's managing the kids when i was in with her in the home uh, in uh, uk and um, i was amazed to see her actually she managed the kids and doing all the classes different different group she had the older women uh, adults uh, group class going on mother and uh, i mean kids uh, they are coming with mother that's different group for the ladies different group as we are doing different groups in the yoga in atelium similarly she is having different different groups uh, on top she is arranging the retreat every year she was arranging and uh, just uh, amazing to see her of course she was arranging for us everything even though we lost to, to have the one with the one entry we locked down <laughs> like we lock in that but even on the top that she arranged for her for us to come back to get the tickets and i was amazed to see her even we couldn't do with our uh, office thing here in the travel office from pondicherry but she just did uh, she was showing us all the park all the uh, big lake and all we are just walking and uh, she just managed to do so i was just amazed just to see her uh, thing always i remember so she's uh, as dr said she's always super woman and uh, as she have the name kalavati amma ji selector for her so she is uh, i mean uh, i mean uh, stimulating with that name she is just taking that uh, essence this bringing out she is doing with that thing so kala with the art so in her whatever she do it's a art form coming out from that so thank you for the opportunity thank you so much kalavati it was very amazing to see you and always uh, looking for you <laughs> to see in every place <laughs> thank you so much thank you ma'am thank you for sharing thank you nilam yes ma'am your words of wisdom and really i wanted to call you but at the time i was thinking that should i or should i not <laughs> thank you so much thank you, you ma'am thank you so much so from here we will be uh, closing our today's session but before that i would like to again invite you just uh, for the tomorrow scintillating saturdays with ananda sir uh, that will be at 7:15 ist and one more thing that the tradition kitananda yoga tradition the core principles that they have uh, one of the core principles is create gurus not followers and the less students best students so this is the one of the many core concepts so this is a tradition with a very deep rooted uh, yoga traditions with many things that we have to learn that we can learn from them and they can help us to learn a lot of things in the field of yoga therapy in our yoga as a lifestyle and many more things so with this closing note i would like to thank all the team members of livalistic wellness our respected mentors and everybody and all the participants we will close with the shanti part so join with me <clears throat> om swasti prajabhyam paripalayantam न्यायेन मार्गेन मही महिषा गोब्राह्मणेभ्य शुभमस्तु नि लोका समस्ता सुखिनो भवन्तु सर्वे भवन्तु सुखिनः सर्वे सन्तु निरामया सर्वे भद्राणि पश्यन्तु मा कश्य दुख भाग भवे 
ओम शांति ही शांति ही शांति ही थैंक यू एवरी वन थैंक यू फॉर बींग विथ अस वी विल सी ऑल ऑफ इट टूमोरो एट फोर थर्टी पी एम आई एस टी एंड थैंक यू सो मच एवरी वन फॉर ज्वाइनिंग टूडे थैंक यू मैम थैंक यू एवरी वन